Because people say they didn't build around Carson Wentz. They built around Carson Wentz. They just made bad decisions. I mean, they drafted uh, a wide receiver in the first round. They drafted a wide receiver in the second round. They drafted a left tackle. They drafted a running back. I mean, they were trying to do everything possible to build up around Carson Wentz. The problem But one thing that, that always has a lure is the National Football League and the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, our good friend and a pro's pro, John McMullen, joins us to discuss the Philadelphia Eagles. Sports Illustrated, uh, Eagles Maven, on se- several other ways that you can uh, read what he writes and what he is saying. But we have got him here tonight, right now. John, how are you, my friend? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Ricky. All right. Now, I, 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 I have already told the audience, and, and you've been on the program before, so you're no stranger to the program, but I heard you earlier today on another interview that you did on a, on a channel that will not be mentioned, but you, op- <laughs> you opened my eyes to a couple of things, and, and I said, you know what, I've got to get John on tonight because they, it was eye-opening, maybe a little bit shocking at the same time, but the more I thought about it in these last five, six hours since I heard you, the more sense it's starting to make. And that's where I start with the word transition. And you kind of you you brought to the surface what a lot of Eagle fans are, are wondering, asking, and that's the direction of this franchise going forward in the and starting with you know, Nick Sirianni's first year here in 2021. And you mentioned that Jeffrey Lurie used very, very, you know, quietly the word a transition year. Okay. What did you take from that? What, what did you read? If, the, if you're reading between the lines, what did you take from Jeffrey Lurie using that word? Yeah, I mean, he used it seven times, so uh, it wasn't just sort of off the cuff. It was was pretty much his theme of his season, you know, not his season ending, but a combination when he he obviously let go of Doug Peterson. uh, He mentioned that word seven different times. So, you know, they're not going to use the term rebuild, Ricky, and that's as close as they're going to get, and, and that's what they were signaling. It's a transition phase for this organization for a lot of reasons. One, they're up against it from a salary cap standpoint. It's even worse now that they've traded Carson Wentz and taken on that precedent-setting dead money hit. Uh, so it's going to be differ- difficult from a salary cap standpoint. You have – you probably held your hand a little bit too long with an aging, expensive roster. Howie Roseman admitted that at his season-ending press conference. Um, I think the pandemic, you mentioned it with college basketball, sports, no fans. I, I think the Eagles recalibrated because if, if you go back to the 2019 season, they admitted we got to get younger. We got to turn this thing over. We got to start going in that direction. Then all of a sudden the pandemic hits and they think to themselves, well, guess what? We, we have an advantage because we have a coach. We have a Super Bowl winning coach who's been here. Everybody in the division is changing, shifting. We should have an opportunity to take advantage of that. And it turned out to be anything but, and they put themselves even further behind, behind. So. It, it's it's difficult, uh, but they're finally in this phase. They're finally realizing it, and it is a rebuild, but they'll call it a transition. Now, the positive thing is this isn't the NBA. So rebuilds in the NFL, they they don't have to be that painful if you make good decisions. The problem is you've got to make good decisions. Right. And the problem here is that the guy that's going to make the decisions – his track record as of late obviously has not been very good. No, and, and everybody's going to pile on Howie Roseman, and, and, right. and they're hearing it, and <laughs> believe me. Uh, and they're getting some rabbit ears, and certainly Howie is. And he, he's taken on a, a ton of criticism, rightfully so. I, I mean, 
They've made a lot of poor decisions when it comes to personnel. Everybody knows the high-profile ones, the most recent Mm -hmm. one, Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson, J.J. over D.K. We all know that. Right. Andre Dillard hasn't worked out. Um, It's interesting because people say they didn't build around Carson Wentz. They built around Carson Wentz. They just made bad decisions. I mean, they drafted uh, a wide right. receiver in the first round. They drafted a wide receiver in the second round. They drafted a left tackle. They drafted a running back. I mean, they were trying to do everything possible to build up around Carson Wentz. The problem is the players haven't developed uh, to where they should have by this point. So, yeah, no question. Um, but the one thing I would say because of, of all the outlay, and this was – why we all kind of thought that there's no way they could move on from Carson Wentz, at least early in the process. I think we were all on that page. We all said, Jeffrey's not going to take this $33.8 million cap hit. Plus, they gave up five draft picks to move up to get him. Plus, they gave him a $128 million extension less than 20 months ago. How do you move on from that? And you know, part of the back end is that they went back to back years with five draft picks, Ricky. I, I mean, so even if you're hitting on players, and if you look at, uh, you know, Dallas Goddard in the second round, that's a good pick. Yeah. But you only have five picks that year. And we all know to build in this league, you need double digit picks. And you, you, you know, the more picks you have, the better the more chance opportunity. you've got. Right? Exactly. Right. So the law of averages was kind of tight for a couple of years because they really had no, you know, no, no breathing room, uh, you know, to make a bad pick. Yeah. And they knew they kind of traded away. Uh, and, and the championship would I think everybody forgets they won the championship. So I think everybody would trade for that. Uh, it, where they made the mistake is they thought that window was open a little bit longer than it really was. And they kept deviling down with this old expensive roster. Jason Peters is probably the poster child of that. Um, and, and that's difficult. That's difficult in any sport when you have to balance uh, at the same time getting younger while also trying to be a contender. That's what the Eagles were trying to do, trying to serve two masters. And they tried to serve them a little bit too long, and it blew up last year. It's a difficult tightrope to walk. You're absolutely correct. Now, using their word, not yours, but their word of transition. Okay. All right. Where do we go in the process of transition here? Is it Zach Ertz next? Is it Malik Jackson? Is it, you know, where this, there, there's got to be more than just Carson Wentz. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, they released to Sean Jackson. Obviously, yeah. that was, we all knew that was coming. I, I think Zach is next. They're trying to trade Zach right now. It'll be interesting. Uh, he wants out. He's essentially, um, if they can't trade him, uh, they're going to release him, I think, before the start of the new league year. They they already renegotiated all Sean Jeffrey and Malik Jackson to get some salary cap relief right now. Uh, what those players gave, gave up um, is essentially that realization to get on the open market. So they will release them before March 17th as well. I think the bigger questions are, you know, some of the stalwarts of this team. Does Jason Kelsey want to continue to play in a transition? I mean, he's talked about retirement, and it's year by year for him at this point. Maybe he does want to play, but maybe he wants to play for a contender. You know, maybe he wants to play with his brother. So could he be moved? Uh, Yeah. Brandon Brooks coming off a really expensive player, really good player, but, you know, Once you get to that age of 30 in this league and he's coming off two Achilles tears in three years, you got to ask, can he go? Can Lane Johnson, same injury issues, aging. Um, Can he go? Fletcher Cox. I I don't think anybody is off the table. I really don't. Uh, And that's because um, this team's going in a completely different direction. I think they have this young coaching staff. Um, first time coach, you know, 29 year old special teams coordinator. They got the youngest position coach in the league, Nick Ross. I, I think they want to get young and they want the staff and a group of young players to kind of grow together. Do you think, John, that in their thinking, 
does it come in in any form, or, you know, to even just a little bit, that attendance for the 2021 season probably won't be 100%. Maybe by September, I, I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong, if they allow 50%, I, I think they would take that in a minute. I, I, I don't think we'll be back to, you know, having 60, whatever, 70,000 people in stadiums by September. But best case scenario, if they could put 50, 50% in Lincoln Financial Field, does that even, you know, have a little, provide them with a little cover for having a down year? Because this past season, for everything that went down, it's almost as if a tree fell in the woods and nobody was there to see it. Yeah. We saw it, you know, if you know what I mean. You know. Yeah, I, well, I do agree that, I mean, the look is bad. If you have 70,000 people there and they're booing you off the field, obviously it looks bad. And I think a lot of us kind of brought that up uh, right after the season when it looked like Doug Peterson was coming back. In fact, I mentioned it and said, you know, I wonder uh, if fans were there. I wonder if in week 17 there was 25. 30,000 people showing up. I wonder if that would have changed the thinking. Now, ultimately, he reversed course and fired him anyway. Right. Um, so I, I, I do think it has a, a little bit uh, of, of an impact uh, when you have that visceral reaction uh, to things going wrong. And, look, it's going to be ugly. I mean, if this team wins four games again or is in that range, uh, yeah, I, I mean, no matter how many fans, if there's – 20,000. They're going to be sounding like 70,000 with their, yeah. uh, with their booing. But, you know, that's one thing the Eagles kind of know. It doesn't, they can go through a transition. These fans aren't going yeah, anywhere. They're, they're not, not going anywhere. No, you're, no. You're, you're, you're absolutely. I mean, the Phillies have to worry about that. The Sixers have to worry about it. The Flyers have to, the Eagles don't have to worry about that. Talking to John McMullen about the Eagles. You brought up another thing that opened my eyes. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you about two phases of the quarterback position. Number one, they're going to need a backup, and I, I mentioned the I mentioned the magic name, John, and that brings up all kinds of opinion. But you know, they need a veteran backup. Is Nick Foles a viable veteran backup? Is that a direction you think this team may go in? And is 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 maybe a Ertz for Foles deal one that would make sense for the Bears? Well, I, I, I would say that I, I think the draft and their evaluation of the draft is going to tell you a lot of what they think about the quarterback position. If they really think Jalen Hurts has an opportunity to be a uh, a real top-tier starter in this league, uh, they're going to go in a different direction. They might bring in a veteran backup. And it might be, you know, not necessarily, I don't think it would be good to bring Nick back, but Tyrod Taylor is a name that people have okay. speculated on because yeah. Shane Steichen was with him. He's the offensive coordinator now. They were together with the Chargers. Jacoby Brissett was obviously in Indianapolis with Nick Sirianni. I think he'd be too expensive, though. I think he's going to be more expensive than people realize. Uh, so they could go that direction. But I got to tell you, Ricky, and I talked about that transition. Now, you go back to 1999 with Andy Reid and how this team and franchise builds. <clears throat> it's quarterback, offensive line, defensive line. Yeah. And here's, by the That's, way, folks, before John gets to it, this was the other thing that I almost went off the road about because he's about to tell you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, and, and if you go back to 2016 and, and listen to Howie Roseman, what he said about being up that high in the draft. And remember, right. they traded up to get that high. They traded up from 13 to 10 to two. So they weren't that bad, uh, starting at 13. Uh, but he said, if you're in this position that high in the draft, you have to take advantage of it. And what he was talking about was the quarterback position. In other words, you know, you got to solve that position. And how do you solve it? Well, odds are you say, you know, you can bring up Tom Brady all you want, but the history says you're much more likely to get a top-tier starter at the top of the draft than even in the second, third round, never mind sixth round. So uh, if the Eagles look at these quarterbacks, and they're not going to have an, a, a chance at Trevor Lawrence, probably not going to have a chance at Zach Wilson, but if, if Justin Fields falls, if, if even Trey Lance, if they think – 
those guys are future stars in this league. They got to do everything possible. They got to pull the trigger and they got to get a quarterback like that in, in this organization. Uh, and I think that's how they'll look at it. But again, it always comes down to the evaluation of the player. And, and same holds true for Jalen Hurts. If they believe he's got a chance to be a top tier starter, you go in a different direction. Maybe you draft a, a Kyle Trask who's with Brian Johnson, the new quarterback's coach in Florida later in the draft or somebody like that. Um, if that's the case, if they believe in Jalen Hurts, they'll probably bring in a veteran backup like Tyrod Taylor. If they don't believe in him, he's going to be the backup. Remember, Ricky, why they drafted Jalen Hurts. All the revisionist history in the world isn't going to change the fact they brought him in to be a cost-effective backup to Carson Wentz for four years. So why can't he be a cost-effective backup to Justin Fields for three years? Think of it that That's this is exactly why I said you opened my eyes because I never, John. I honestly can say that I never looked at it that way. But then when you go back in time and the philosophy and the mentality of, of Howie and the organization, you are absolutely correct. When you're up that high, which you you know, and hopefully the Eagles are not this high up in the draft, you know, soon. In the next couple of years, I, but when you are up this high, you may as well, you know, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. If you're up this high, you may as well go for something uh, that that could form your team for the next umpteen years. Am I correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the position you have to get, and and then from there, it kind of trickles down to their belief of offensive line, defensive line. Uh, and you know, it's understandable. Fans get excited about uh, skill position players and. Um, you know, they'll probably want the, uh, Jamar Chase, Devontae Smith, a receiver. Um, but those guys are just not as impactful as obviously quarterbacks. I think everybody understands that, but even edge rushers, left tackles, players like that, uh, that's how the Eagles built their organization. And, and they've been, let's be honest, more successful than most despite the occasional hiccup, which obviously this season was. If you're a betting man, do you think the Eagles draft a quarterback? If I was a betting man, I think they will try. And, and, and again, we're very early in that draft process. Now, they could right. look at, at, at Justin Fields and say, you know what, he's not a top ten pick. I, I don't believe they will think that, but it's possible. Okay. And they could look at Trey Lance and say he's not a top ten pick, and that's more of a possibility. And then you you don't want to reach for a quarterback. So that's the difficult – that's always the difficulty of the draft. you, you got to get the evaluation right. And unfortunately, you know, people are going to point to last year and say Rager versus Jefferson. Well, you know, actually the scouting department picked Jefferson. They wanted Jefferson. It was the coaching staff that, that pushed for Jalen Rager and how he uh, gave the coaching staff the player they wanted. Uh, it didn't work out. Uh, you know, Andre Dillard, um, who knows what would have happened if he didn't tear his biceps, but he, he, he did not have a good rookie season. We can say that, uh, we know where JJ Ortega Whiteside is. So too many misses in, in the premium picks of the drafts in recent seasons, but it's easier at six in, in theory. Uh, you have better players, obviously the higher you go in the draft and, the Eagles should get a good player. Uh, but if it is a quarterback and they value that quarterback, um, they got to do everything possible. And guess what? They have extra draft capital now. This is a Carson Wentz trade. So if they believe in Justin Fields and they got to go up to three to get him, go do it. Mm. Just the thought of that is, is, is starting, I'm telling you, it's starting to make a bunch of Eagle fans cringe. But the more you think about it, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But I'm just saying you are right about the possibility of the organization going in that direction when you look at the way, uh, you know, the, the philosophically they've operated uh, in the past. I thought it was fascinating, and the way you explained it, there's no arguing with you, John. They may go in that direction, and if they do, there's precedent for it. Yeah, and I, I you know, by the way, I think it, you'll you'll hear the same thing in most NFL cities. I, I mean. 
Mm-hmm. You know, believe me, that's what Jacksonville is thinking right now. Uh, Joe Douglas uh, up in New York with the Jets up in North Jersey, I mean, he's going to do everything possible to get to Sean Watson. If he doesn't, uh, he's probably going to draft Zach Wilson. Uh, and then, you know, I, I've seen mock drafts already where people understand the three quarterbacks are probably going to go one, two, three, because somebody's going to trade up to three to get Justin Fields. If, uh, he's not taken there. And Miami, they're trying to get to Sean Watson. So everybody understands you got to get the quarterback. It is going to be probably the most eventful and interesting offseason from a league, not just the Eagles, but from really from the entire league's point of view that we have seen uh, in, a, in a very, very long time. Uh, in my last 30 seconds with you, and I'll go back to that word, transition. So you're convinced the organization is comfortable with a year of transition, and you also think that the fan base will put up with a year of transition, correct? Uh, well, I, I don't know if they're comfortable, but they understand, and, and okay. that's what they signaled by taking that $33.8 million in dead money. Okay. That basically, they signaled we have to take our medicine, and we're going to take a bit of a hit this year. The pandemic lowered the salary cap as well, so you have a double whammy. But the fans, yeah, I mean, they'll be upset, but they're not going anywhere. You know that, Ricky. Oh, no, I, I, that, that I can guarantee. Eagle fans, they they might get mad. They may get angry. They may yell and scream every once in a while. But believe you me, when those helmets get on the heads of those players, they'll be there. John, fascinating. You, I'm telling you, ever since this afternoon when I heard you, it opened my eyes, and I said, I've got to bring it to the program. Doing an incredible job, and we hope to talk to you again as the, uh, as the eventful offseason starts to take shape, my friend. All right, th- thanks, Ricky. I appreciate it. You got it. That's John McMullen, Sports Illustrated, Eagles Maven. The, the, the middle. The middle. At that point, I told you, but I got a hangover mess. So what is this hangover? Hard. Yeah, what's with this hangover? Right, I mean, yeah. what, what, what happened yesterday? Cheap vodka, bro. Cheap vodka, man. What? what, what? Well, I took yeah. pineapple vodka with the pineapples, and I infused it for like a That's week. Too or much two. pineapple. Pineapple it, is and, terrible. And it, was too, it was it was so sweet that you would just just keep on drinking, and I just kept on drinking it. Do you say you took pineapple vodka and then infused it into pineapples? Yes. I mean, there's there's sorority girls right now at Penn State that are <laughs> laughing at you, Barrett. He took pineapple vodka and infused it into pineapples. Oh, I my. thought it would be a better taste, and it was a better taste. It was a great taste. It just went down too fast. What's out? Way too fast, oh man. My. And next thing you know, man, next thing you know, three shades to the wind. See, watching Quayle got... Latifah. Oh, my this God. The... That's the line of the day. <laughs> the Middle with Aton Shander, Barrett Brooks, and Harry Mays. Weekdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern.